Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike Young, your host, and this is part one of our interview with former Mirage 5 pilot Marcel Depetta. In this episode, Marcel chats about what it was like to fly the Mirage 5, DACT against F 104s, and his ejection in 1985. If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like to support the channel, you can do this by donating monthly at patreon.com forward slash aircrew interview, where we have four different tiers for you to choose from. This greatly helps us to continue putting out regular quality content. Thank you and enjoy. So Marcel, when did you first become interested in aviation? Well, in fact, my father was also an aviator. He was not a pilot, but he was involved in the uh, in the Belgian Air Force. So as from a, a, a young kid, uh, I saw it at home and my father talked about the Air Force. So it was not that difficult to get involved in uh, uh, and be prepared for a, a career into the Air Force. That's, uh, that's the old start, thanks to my father. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what year did you actually join the Belgium Air Force? I was only 16, and uh, first of all, I went to, to what we call in Belgium the uh, Cadet School. It's uh, a school for uh, cadets uh, to get us prepared, and then after after three years, so at the age of 19, I succeeded for uh, the training for a pilot in the for the Belgian Air Force, so I could join. Uh, and we started our training on the uh, Marchetti. That's a small propeller aircraft. <laughs> so afterwards, we moved to the Fuga Magister, uh, which we flew also for uh, 125 hours. And the last one was the T-33, the, the, the shooting star. And then afterwards, we got our wings and I moved on to Mirage. That was uh, in, a, in a small... Uh, um, in a small summary with my military career, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what were your first thoughts on the aircraft when you first saw it? Uh, well, uh, as I said, coming from the T-33, an American aircraft, which is a huge space in the cockpit, entering the Mirage, it is so small and so tiny. And as from the first flights, I said to myself, yes, this is it. And I felt so comfortable in the aircraft. It was like it was made for me. And as I told you, not being the very first in ranking on my promotion, I ended up as the first one on the uh, on the uh, after the uh, my training flights on Mirage. And really, this was the aircraft for me. So it was a totally another concept, French concept, which the pros and the contras, like on uh, any kind of an aircraft. But uh, and the Delta aircraft, the specifications of flying in Delta, uh, it was something for me. So mm -hmm. I felt very happy in that aircraft, which resulted uh, of uh, staying on the aircraft for 18 years. And I flew 3,200 hours on it. So mm -hmm. that made quite a bit of a career. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and before we move on to your obviously ground training and flying training, what was the Mirage 5 actually designed for for the Belgium Air Force? Well, we bought it as a, what we call a fighter bomber. Initially, the French concept was rather a fighter, pure fighter, but uh, we had to replace the F-84. Uh, uh, at that time, we, have, we had the uh, F-84, RF-84, and also the Starfighter in service. So the, the government decided to replace it by the Mirage in a fighter bomber role. So that means we got uh, very big uh, fuel tanks uh, and our main um, missions were air to ground uh, missions, what we call McMover. Yeah. McMover, yes. So let's talk about some of your <coughs> ground training on the aircraft. When did it start and was it difficult coming from your, you know, the Fuga and the T-33? Uh, it started in uh, 1974 when I joined the OCC, Operation Conversion Unit, in the 8th Squadron. And the 8th Squadron, which became later on my main squadron, in which I spent it all, all my time, uh, they gave you a conversion course of approximately 70 to 80 hours, showing you around a little bit the, the flight envelope for 30 to 40 hours and then 
teaching you how to work with the aircraft. Uh, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how long did your ground training take before you were, I guess, combat ready? Well, it took uh, approximately seven to eight months. And then we were leaving the 8th Squadron and we were dispersed or what we call the, the young pilots at a special name in Belgium. And we call them Ye Ye. And that was a call uh, when we were calling later on, we as a monitor, Ye Ye. Uh, so they had to come for the education. But uh, as I said, after seven or eight months in the 8th Squadron, we had three more uh, Mirage Squadrons, the first one also in uh, BRZ, uh, and then the second squadron was in Florin, and 42 squadron was in Florin as well. So mm -hmm. depending on the results you obtained in the 8th squadron, you were dispersed to 1st, 2nd or 42 squadron. That's mm -hmm. it, yeah. yeah. And we're going to have to talk about your first flight in the Mirage. What was it like mm -hmm. with that first afterburner takeoff? Uh, well, uh, like uh, most of our EAs, it's so amazing. It's going that fast in full burner. And what the instructors, and I did it myself many times afterwards, we took what we call a LIS, so an aircraft, minimum fuel, uh, only internal, no racks, no external pines, just to show off the speed. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. And uh, unless the fact that <clears throat> the students had to obtain a very high degree of knowledge, they were really overruled by the speed and, and then that amazing high speed angle takeoff uh, sitting on the burner coming from the T-33, which was a very old and uh, on takeoff it goes. Ka -ta -tum, ka -ta -tum. So, <laughs> yeah, that was really an amazing uh, uh, yeah, discovery, but uh, I liked it that much. So I said, no, Marcel, my nickname for the, the Air Force is Salah. Sure. Salah, this is going to be your aircraft. So good feeling, very good Absolutely. feeling. Absolutely. So could you tell us something of your flying training uh, you conducted in the Mirage? Was it mainly air-to-air -air or mainly air-to-ground or a bit of both? No, the let's say 90% was air-to-ground. So we were, uh, in those days, we call we. Uh, speak about the goal, uh, the Cold War. Uh, we had pre-planned missions, uh, and but most of them were air-to-ground targets. Either it were installations, or it was uh, troops on the ground, or what we call forward air control fact missions in support of uh, the, the the troops on the ground from our side that that needed help to intervene. Uh, but situated in those days, it was rather primitive, if you can compare it to what they are doing now on F-16, like in the Gulf War and all that. So, But that was the main. We did the training. We went to uh, Solenzana, which is in Corsica, an island in the Mediterranean Sea. And it was a joint venture with, with the French and the Belgian Air Force. So, And there we can go for training. Air combat, air to air, and air to air shooting as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was wow. Yeah. So, would so what weapons at this point in time would the Mirage be carrying for air to ground missions? Air to ground missions. We had the cluster bomb uh, BL seven five five. We had the Snake Eyes, the M uh, Mark eighty four, and we had the, the Matra. That was a French uh, bomb. It was. Uh, Delated by a parachute, uh, 400 kilos. And for self-defense, we were carrying the uh, 30 millimeter gun, DEFA, uh, and the missile sidewinders. Yeah, that was uh, the armament setting. Oh, also the rockets. Yeah, we had uh, 2.75 inches rockets that were also at the Auden outboard station on the aircraft. So. Pretty well loaded, uh, plus the big pylon tanks. So, nevertheless, it was a pure Delta, which on the move, mm -hmm. uh, turning and fighting a beautiful aircraft, but loaded with all that stuff, it was rather uh, heavy one. Let's call it like that. Yeah. yeah. I think that's uh, the case with most aircraft once it's loaded up. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, did you actually get to, you know, launch or drop any live ordnance? Uh, 
on one side, luckily, no. On the other side, as you are training for it, but uh, let's say the closest we came, that was in 91 for the Gulf, uh, the first Gulf War. Uh, as you know, that uh, we had the Ace Mobile Forces, yeah. which are dedicated squadrons that had to go to the north, to Norway or to the south, to Turkey. And at those days, uh, 91, my squadron was dedicated IMF South. So that means as soon as the Gulf War started, we were transferred to uh, uh, Diyarbakir, which is a uh, military airfield, uh, Turkish military airfield, close to the Iran, the Iraq border. And we had to patrol uh, to see if there was some invasion and all that. But... Uh, yeah, that, that's in fact the closest I came for live weapon delivery. So in fact, I didn't drop anything now. And we're going to have to talk about the Mirage 5's handling characteristics. What was it like mm -hmm. to fly and what were its strengths and weaknesses? Well, uh, it was a beautiful aircraft turning-wise. We could turn it around. The big problem was there was no engine in it. And I mean, the engine was not... Uh, strong enough to be able to overcome the uh, the drag index uh, as soon as you got into steep turns and we could go up to seven six points uh, seven let's say seven g's mm -hmm. then the the fact of bleeding g energy on such a huge amount the engine couldn't get it up so that was the weakness part was the engine the strongest was we could turn it as a beauty we had a roller rate of 400 degrees a second, wow. which was amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Because when we get when when we had visitors from other squadrons during squadron exchanges, of course, no big pylons, only supersonic pylons, 400 uh, 4,000 liters on board, and then we went and we went and he never stopped turning. A very beautiful aircraft. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So did you have the same engine that the French, uh, you know, Air Force had or was it upgraded <coughs> yeah. in time? Or? No, no, no. It was the same engine. Some upgrades were our engine was the Atar 9 Charlie, but you had the 9 Bravo and all that. On. We had uh, nozzles instead of paupieres and, and all that. Things. It was a little bit improved, but not on such a way that it could overcome the drag index of a pure Delta. No, that mm -hmm. was that was an, a little bit an, yeah a bad feeling, a, a wrong feeling, because uh, afterwards the the uh, Israeli Air Force managed to get the, the G79 engine from the 104, which was a beautiful air, uh, engine, into the Mirage. They called it the Kfir, and a couple yeah. of my friends went to uh, went to Israel and flew that one. Now you have and the engine and the Delta to turn around. That's about an aircraft. You can't compare. We call it the second generation aircrafts, like the 104, the Phantom, the Jaguar, the Mirage and all that. You can't compare it anymore with the ones who are flying now, like F-16 and all that. That's uh, another generation, so there's no comparison. Yeah, completely, yeah. So do you think the Mirage 5 was better in the air-to-ground role or air-to-air -air role, in your opinion? Well, um, I think it was better for our aircraft and our uh, uh, targets we had to go for. It was normal that he was constantly sitting for the air-to-ground role, yeah. We could go a little bit for the air-to-air, -air, but, you know, uh, a turning fight uh, with 30 millimeter bullets it's not exactly a good way to conduct a fight, no, 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 no. Yeah, so all of our viewers will always love this question. So how did the Mirage 5 fare in DACT or ACM against the types, you know, of the time, I'm guessing, that probably was the S... It, it was so amazing. Uh, let's compare it with the F-104. Mm -hmm. He was sitting on an engine, but no wings. I was sitting on wings, but no engine. <clears throat> and it was during turning fight. It was always the same scenario. We kept on turning and he kept on moving. And somewhere in between, we met each other. If some of the two pilots got involved, for example, if a starfighter would start a turning fight, he was lost. And if a young Mirage pilot would try to go 
upstairs and try to get the 104 is that that for yeah. sure <laughs> and then it, it was the same thing for for the phantom phantom was also nice turning very good engines so that was a bit of a not exactly a pure turning fight but it was a uh, up going, down coming, and, and all those kind of things. So that uh, in air to air we could stand or, uh, yeah, yeah. But then came the F16, and yeah, that uh, he has a kind of a delta with a splendid engine. So that was the end of the game. Right? So we we skipped it. <laughs> <coughs> and then those days they sent us to Corsica, and I do remember because we had many many air to air to air missions over there. But then we we get up with two Mirages against one F-16 or four Mirages against a pair of F-16. So, you know, right. an amazing thing that I can tell you that uh, the people from Top Gun came along and uh, as the Mirage is comparable to the Fishbat, which was the main opponent in those days, uh, we had a few... Uh, People from the States, uh, aggressive pilots uh, that came along, asked to uh, get the trip into our backseat uh, and to show what uh, pure Delta really could mean. So that was, uh, yeah, air to ground. Yeah. So let's talk about your first frontline squadron. I think you said it was eight squadron. What was the role of that squadron and where were you based? But in fact, when I uh, when I finished the OCC Operation Conversion, Code, I was sent to Florence to uh, uh, to the second squadron. Oh yeah, so, second squadron. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. second squadron, uh, on which I stayed for two and a half years, something like that, to become a little bit mature on on the fighter bomber role. I managed to get the pair leader at that moment. And I think uh, after two and a half years, they needed somebody uh, as an instructor, as uh, an eventually instructor pilot on Mirage. So I, I had to go back or I could go back to the 8th squadron. And then after a stage of a couple of months, they, they, they proposed me to become uh, the instructor, one of the instructor pilots on Mirage. And then after a few years, I became the chief instructor pilot from all the Mirage fleet in Belgium. Yeah, that was a funny job. I liked it, yeah. <laughs> we will certainly get onto that. But uh, yeah, what was it like <coughs> being on the uh, like a frontline squadron for the first time? And what sort of flying would you do? Would you be up in the air every day or was it like a yeah. couple of times a week? Uh, could you tell no, me no, about no, this? No, no, no. The idea was, especially in... Uh, not exactly in the in second squadron because we were many many pilots on the on the flight in in the squadron. But afterwards in uh, eight squadron, my daily job was flying. Yes, uh, we mentioned uh, we get up up to two hundred and eighty hours a year uh, on an end, and it took uh, uh, many preparation time, especially with the students, one because it's a face to face uh, uh, event. Uh, briefing, flying, day briefing, and on the, on the other end is that uh, we were still uh, keeping our operational capacity in the eighth squadron. So <clears throat> that's why, uh, let's say ninety percent, eighty percent, I was instructor pilot. But on the other end, as soon as there was a, a declaration of exercise uh, and even takeval, uh, we were changing head, and then we went up to and get the job done as, uh, as an operational pilot. That's why I just show you this uh, plate, <coughs> which is from my squadron. And apparently in the years 84, 85, we managed to get a rate one, which is rather a new uh, and a super shot we did. So it was both sides. Wow. We were, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really it. cool, Marcel, right there. <laughs> Okay. But um, yeah, did you ever fly the Mirage Five on any large, you know, NATO exercises or even further abroad like America? Uh, no, we couldn't. We didn't have the air-to-air -air refueling, so that means that uh, our area of operation was from uh, uh, Norway till Turkey. That's it. Yes, but yeah, I flew in. Uh, I was uh, the the team leader of the Belgian delegation in the TAM-88, that was one of the biggest uh, 
moves we did. And uh, at a certain moment, they got, I got the lead from, I think, 87 aircrafts. But that's on theory. But I had to give the big briefing. And the idea was uh, uh, out of Solingen, there was a Mars launch that took more than one hour. Wow. On, on, on. It was amazing. And then we had to, to stack up all the aircrafts into Germany, above Germany in the airspace. And then at a certain moment, and I still remember on the radio frequency, a kind of a song, tra, 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 and we moved all into France because we fight the bombers. We had to attack uh, different uh, kind of uh, targets. The F-15s uh, were in front of us. And I still remember the... Um, the expression from those guys, we're going to sterilize the area. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so they were sitting in front of us, the French aircraft took off with a mass of, of aircrafts running into the what we call the gorilla. That was the big shape of all those kind of aircraft. And the F-15 drivers, they just told us on the, on the morning briefing, guys, no problem. We're going to sterilize the area. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> but that, that was, you know, high... I marks, uh, I points in my career were those kind of missions, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yes. So, how did you think, <clears throat> uh, you know, other nations viewed the Mirage Five? Were they impressed by it? Well, it was a not known aircraft, but as you know, France is always being a little bit apart. They were joining the the NATO, but we were not part of the NATO. Nobody knows what they want, but anyway, that's their way of doing. And uh, we were the only NATO Air Force flying the Mirage. So that means when we were landing somewhere, let's say it was uh, uh, something uh, special to deal with. Uh, also, the cross-servicing was a little bit complicated uh, and all that. So uh, it was a, a dual feeling for the other ones. So it was nice to see, nice to fly, which I, uh, I told you already. And then, uh, yeah, it was uh, was nice to have a bird like that. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, as you mentioned before, you became <laughs> an instructor on the Mirage Five. How did this happen? And did you uh, apply for this, or were you picked for it? Well, uh, I ended up first of my promotion uh, on T thirty three, and then it was quote quote normal that they ask you, they ask you, you know what I mean, for the Air Force, they ask you <clears throat> what kind of an aircraft I would like to fly. And I said I would like to go to Mirage. And I got that uh, my first choice. So I was a happy man. Yeah, yeah I like to work uh, individual with, uh, with people. And uh, I can say that out of 404 pilots that were solo on the Mirage, I think I got uh, more than 200, 220, 230 that came through my hands. So uh, it was really something fascinating how people are reacting. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the guys we had to kick in the air. <clears throat> <laughs> if I can say other, one, other ones, we had to deal very carefully. And it was a challenge for me. Uh, to feel the guy, to understand him, and to get him up to a level that I could say, okay, you're ready for the squadron. It was mm -hmm. a, a very, very uh, a sensation, a feeling that I really enjoyed. And uh, furthermore, when I see many, many of my uh, former yeas, like we call them, uh, the, uh, yeah, they are still big friends and all that, so very special, yeah. And were you teaching mainly air to ground again, like rather than air to air? Was that the main focus yeah, of yeah, your job? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, merely air to ground. And we give them one, uh, uh, one air to air campaign for approximately 10 to 10 hours or something. So they have a little bit of an idea, but as it was not our main goal, the main goal was being a mud mover, air to ground. So that was, uh, yeah, yeah, but not exactly air to air, not that much we had the, the pure fighter sitting on the other side so that wasn't <laughs> a, yeah 
And then in 1985, you had a pretty dramatic event happen to you. Can you talk yes. us through this, Marcel? Yeah, yeah. Now I can, but uh, uh, I had a major accident, so I had to bail out from my, uh, my Mirage. And the thing is that I got, I was the AW officer from the wing, the electronic warfare officer. And I set it up uh, a big uh, gorilla attack on the AUX belt. So that was the missiles situated on the IGB in the German border. And I think we took off with uh, five mirages. I had the lead and the support came from the wild weasels. Uh, phantoms in Spandau and uh, bad weather in Belgium and nevertheless we got through and in the area of Hobston I got uh, problems with the engine in fact I lost one of the blades from the turbine Ooh. and uh, I got so many vibrations that I decided to divert to Guttersloh but uh, at a certain moment, uh, the starting engine, which is sitting in front of the compressor, there were bits and bytes coming along, coming off, went into the compressor, and my engine exploded. And it was, I had the, I was in final in Gutterslow. So uh, if it could have, if the Atar, <coughs> my engine should have turned, let's say, one minute longer. I would have been on the ground, but unfortunately, wow. he exploded, and then I had to eject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yes. And uh, you actually have a piece of your ejection behind you, don't you? Yeah, yeah. This is uh, my ejection seat, and uh, the amazing part is uh, I have even a number. I am number three thousand nine hundred and sixty-six uh, pilot. <coughs> Excuse me. Pilot rescued by Martin Baker. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I got a medal and I got a blade and all that. And what happened, what saved me, in fact, uh, I prepared this mission, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the, uh, this is the real cartridge which uh, ejected me from the aircraft. Can you it's put amazing. it further up to the camera, Marcel, yeah. so our yeah. viewers can get yeah. a bit of it? Wow. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah. this is so, and it's uh, like a bullet. It's uh, just exciting you, and off you go. 19 times the uh, 19 Gs. And I can tell you it's not exactly the funniest thing I ever did in my life. But anyway, I survived, and I'm so grateful to Martin Baker. And there is, uh, perhaps you can look it up later on, if you go to the uh, Martin Baker um, uh, website, they asked me to write an article on what things that happened to me. In fact, what happened, I ejected and I landed in a wooden area. And my chute was, so I fell through the trees, but my chute was hanging in the, on the top of the trees. Oh. And I went through and I was hanging there um, for approximately 35 minutes. Now I can tell you, um, it, when you are nicely strapped in your aircraft and afterwards you are sitting on the traps, on the straps as a man, it's not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can laugh about it, but I, I can imagine it was unpleasant. That, uh, it was not uh, the most comfortable position uh, up, up, up over there. And what happened is um, my Bravo which was orbiting around the crash site. He contacted Guttersloh. Immediately, the Puma guys from the squadron over there, the, the fighter uh, helicopters, they came along. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to be rescued within a couple of minutes. But the thing is that they, they don't have a winch. So it's a attack helicopter. So he came along, made one or two moves, and then that awful sound being not in a very good position and he went back again. Oh. Mike, I tell you, I said, come on, get <laughs> me out of here. Second helicopter that came along was from the Polizei. Small air, uh, helicopter, couldn't do anything. And then came along the Ch uh, Chinook, one of uh, your Air Force. 
he over on top of me and that was the moment I got scared. The bailout, as I was instructed on the Mark IV, the uh, Martin Baker for I, I was so confident uh, he will get me out of here, that's no problem. But when the Chinook was hovering on top of me, I said, Jesus Christ, man, the, the trees were going up and down. And unfortunately, he went away. But at that moment, he took the lead of the of the rescue mission. He, he stayed on top of the area and he directed other people to come along to, to help me. And a very special item is that at that moment, it was Lieutenant Andy Pulford, which afterwards, and I will read it, became your Air Chief Marshal Sir Andrew Douglas Pulford, Commander of the Royal Air Force. Isn't that amazing? What so, a story, Marcel. I, I never had contact with that gentleman, but if for any reason he should see this, uh, your movie or your emission, sir, uh, thanks a lot for 1985 being part of my survival. And uh, thank you, sir. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I'll do my best, but I know a few Chinook guys, so maybe I yeah. can put you in touch with them, uh, you know, put you in your yeah, direction. That, yeah, that should be amazing. But, you know, it took me years and years before I could uh, really speak about it and all that. And then now so many years ago, we went into the research and we found all those things. To, and then one of my friends, Mark uh, from Bruges, he, he is my research engine. Uh, if I need something, he will pick it up and all that. And he found that uh, he became the commander of the Royal Air Force. So. Once again, Absolutely. sir. I mean, I'm going to have to read that story myself, Marcel. Yeah. So if you can send me the link, that would be go, perfect. You just go on the website of uh, Martin Baker. And okay. uh, I said, I am number 31966 HXT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think okay. they are over 7,000 already now. Uh, yeah, Marcel, how many hours did you get on the type? I flew 3,200 uh, 3, hours, yes. And... Uh, in Belgium, there are two colleagues that flew more than I did. Uh, Cisa Arts, 3,250. If I would, if I knew it, I would accelerate a bit. <laughs> then the top of the bill is uh, Gust Janssen. He flew more than 4,000 hours on the Mirage 5. Yes. yes, yes.